Hi everyone, I'm Dennis Foley from Acoustic Fields. Bruce and I are just kind of sitting in his room and, and we're going to talk a little bit. And Bruce is going to ask me a few questions about uh, some of the things we've done and the technologies I've developed. And uh, the first question I think is the foam. Absolutely. Why did I create the foam? There's a lot of foams out there. They do certain things well, but, but most of the time they don't do the right thing well. And the right thing is frequencies below 500 cycles. When I developed the foam for the conference rooms with the development company, I realized that, oh this is Bo. Bo's a good boy. Uh, I realized that um, the human vocal range was from 100 cycles to about 800 cycles and current foam technologies on the marketplace were just not doing that. They did everything about above 500 cycles really well. Every, everybody can do that with their foams. But below 500, not so good. And that's really the most important part. From 100 to 500 is, is where we, we really need to focus because that's what, 60, 65 percent of the activity in the human uh, vocal range, both female and male. So I made a concerted effort after trying uh, many of the foams that were in the marketplace, trying to figure out a, a better way to do it. Why foam? Well, foam is very uh, lightweight. It, it's easy to, to ship. It's easy to uh, form and, and uh, make into different shapes. Um, it's not so easy to build, but it's not that bad either. Uh, we have kind of a special process we use and uh, it's uh, fairly economical. The main thing that I was after was a smooth transition from 100 cycles to 500 cycles and we've achieved that with our foam and you can uh, look at the performance data on our website. So I wanted something that was lightweight, economical, easy to work with. I didn't want mineral wool, I didn't want fibers, I didn't want people breathing fibers that were working on the material so I stayed with the foam because that was the way to go uh, it, to meet all the parameters that we had uh, for, for our uh, upper end uh, conference rooms and, and offices. And then we started to realize that the foam really worked well for music and absorbing a little bit uh, more energy at 125 cycles and, and a nice transition to 250 really worked well for vocals but really worked well for music also so thus we've started to tell people about it for music and, and uh, some of the local studios here in town have actually torn out their oral X and Sonex and put our foams in so we're, we're slowly uh, catching on people are slowly realizing that the absorption curves in our foams are different they're unique and they're really smooth and they really work well for uh, voice and uh, music both so we're, we're excited about our foam technology. There's no question it's worked in this room, but what about the carbon? The carbon well, the carbon uh, technology took us uh, a while to uh, figure out. We, uh, we built so many rooms, I think 114 in our database, and I wanted to come up with a way to take that construction methodology and, and the vibration uh, free uh, systems that we developed and make it in a freestanding unit that people could put in, the, in their houses in their hi-fi rooms uh, and not obviously build walls although we can do that and, and sometimes I prefer doing that but uh, a lot of times people don't want to put walls and, and tear out uh, walls and add new things into their home so I understand that so it took us about six years to figure out the construction techniques that, that we wanted to use and inside each one of our units is a structural uh, representation of what we, we did in a permanent build situation. Seven different layers, uh, vibration damping compounds between each la layer. So we have a cabinet that is built in all honesty better than most uh, speaker cabinets and uh, probably equal to your high-end speaker cabinets uh, in terms of uh, vibrational characteristics. So we have a very inert cabinet. And then I, I've tried to figure out, okay, I need a fill material because I want to raise this, the Q value of inside the cabinet. I, I want to get this thing to be really powerful. I want to create 
a really high low pressure area inside the cabinet and that's what I finally discovered with the carbon which as we were talking the other day it was strictly by accident I had a water filter on the office uh, faucet blinking and I couldn't figure out how to get it off get it apart so I, I hit it with a hammer and out comes all this little granules and charcoal so I uh, I have magnifying glass and one of those that the jewelers use because I'm always looking at uh, things and closely and I put it under there and, and looked at it and it's full of holes and so I started doing a lot of research on activated carbon or, or charcoal as it's called and uh, it filters wa water, it filters air so sound is in both of those mediums so lo and behold we started uh, testing it and, and working with it and it was finally uh, the material that we come across actually we we did use one uh, material that was kind of promising it's called zeolite which is a, a filtering agent we even used diatomaceous earth we've even tried those but activated carbon pound for pound gave us the best performance and uh, we're real happy with the performance of the units. Our ACDA12 unit is a really powerful sponge, 30, 40, 50 cycles, because that's what our data in our room uh, database told us. In 96 or 97 percent of the rooms, we had 30, 40, and 50 cycle problems. So that's the reason for the ACDA12. And then the ACDA10 is a broadband absorber from 30 cycles to 200 and it's about 24 25 percent absorption through that range and it's real it's not linear but it's pretty close and, and it's a nice broadband absorber uh, uh, to kind of fill in the gaps uh, uh, with the other frequencies so we have two powerful sponges so to speak for low frequency energy with the activated carbon charcoal on the inside we use 65 pounds of it in, in each unit. Bruce's uh, units are custom. They're bigger. They're 30 by 60. So he's actually got 85 pounds in his units. So um, we wanted to keep the ratios and everything uh, together. And it uh, really does a great job. Now, you need more than one unit. You need more than two units in an average room. Uh, four units is probably a good start point, And uh, some rooms need a little bit more. It just depends on how big of a low frequency problem you have and most people have big low frequency problems and you got to get the low frequency energy right first because that's the foundation for your mids and highs to ride upon. If you don't get the low end right, your mids and highs are going to suffer. So if you don't get the low end right, the mids and highs are going to be masked by room modes and, and uh, low frequency pressure areas. and we don't need that. We've all heard those. We're all frustrated by those and uh, that's what we've uh, decided to, to do. I started my hi-fi journey back in the 60s. I, uh, back then, if you remember, it was the Sansui's amplifier and the Sansui speakers and, and the guys who went to Vietnam would would buy those and ship them back to the states. Well, I was fortunate to get. Remember the Sansui uh, speakers that had the, the the woodworking on the grill, the lattice work, yeah, and then the fabric behind them. So I, I had a set of those. Actually, I had a quad system, so I had four speakers. Remember the quad system? For the double advents. Yeah, the quadraphonics. Yeah. Yeah. So there wasn't any music sources hardly available, you know. But you had the four speakers and you basically sat in the center of the room. But um, so that that's kind of how I started, and then I uh, I got more uh, interested in in the '60s and uh, went to the components and the separates. I think I had a dual uh, 1229 turntable and Shure cartridge and uh, Marantz amplifier. I think Model 30 and some JBL 100s. I believe was the speakers that I started with. In my first album, I remember this to this day was James Gang Rides Again. I just watched an interview on uh, Guitar Center the other day with Joe Walsh and it was a great interview and he was telling about uh, uh, being, being in the James Gang and, and uh, how he came about to be the singer because the, the singer they had at the time quit. So he, he had to sing and, and this is how it all came about. So it was really funny to uh, hear all that. But uh, since that time I've owned uh, numerous equipments. Uh, 
cello music and films, uh, performance two amplifiers. I've probably had 10 of those monos, blocks, hundreds of thousands of dollars in those amplifiers. Uh, Krell's, uh, uh, Dan D'Agostino's uh, amps, the old uh, reference series with the kind of the round eye in the middle with the meter on it. I, I've had four of those. B&W 800s, I've had uh, Mark Levinson's uh, cello uh, big towers, multiple uh, array systems. And um, B&W, I, I think I've had the 800s, the 801s, the 803s, the 805s. Um, just all, all kinds of gear. But I, I think I totaled it up the other day. It's about 400000 in gear that I've bought over the years and uh, I always had room modes like we all do I always had those areas that when you played certain parts of the music it was like oh no there's that that big mess of pudding sort of speak in the room and you know so when you were giving demos to your friends you, you tried to avoid that you tried to not play that particular song because it emphasized the bad parts of your room. Yeah. But no matter what the gear was I bought, yeah. I could never get the room to sound the way I wanted. So I started focusing on the room. I didn't have the kind of money that Dennis did. I, I don't think I did 400000 but I know that after my Pioneer Double Advent system in the late 60s in Chicago, I went directly to the um, Stereo 70 PAS 3X so I was a tube guy, and um, LS35As, and I went through that whole thing, and then I chased the dream from there, and um, went through MagnaPans, and anyway. Oh, you had MagnaPans? Yeah. Huh? Yeah. And uh, was still chasing what I thought was really good sound, um, and I've been chasing it for... As long as I have. Yeah, for a long time. And the difference now is... I've realized that um, if I were chasing something else in room acoustics and room treatment and what Dennis has been talking about, and I'm technically, I have no idea what he's even saying, but I can tell you what my ears hear, and um, uh, we were just talking tonight, I just went from uh, almost a $20,000 pair of speakers to a, a horn speaker that is... 10% of the price of that. And we've got a room going on now that absolutely blows what I had away. So There you go. Yeah. See, end of the story. It's not the price of your gear. Yeah. You can get that emotional connection with your music. You can make that music part of you if you treat your room correctly. 50, 60, I'm almost going to say in some cases 75% of what you're after is getting the room out of the way, getting rid of those acoustical distortions of your room, comb filtering, speaker boundary interference reflect, uh, effect, uh, room modes, and poor diffusion. You, you didn't know anything about diffusion. No. But in, in, in the last two weeks, I, I promise you, we, we have added, we have added a $20,000 cartridge a forty thousand dollar phono preamp, and it's unbelievable what's happened to this room with diffusion. And I'm being very serious. And people people don't understand that there's a reason poor diffusion is one of the four major room acoustic distortions in in, in small rooms. They just they don't understand um, how important good diffusion in a room is. Yeah. How important it is to voice. I mean, even our vocals, even our voice is better, you know, next to the diffusers. They don't understand how important diffusion is. Quadratic diffusion is one form of diffusion. There's others, you know, that you can try. I like quadratic because it's consistent and it's predictable. And you can get at least two dimensions of diffusion. You can get horizontal and vertical diffusion. And... Uh, that that's important and and having the proper diffusion in a room especially a room where music is played yeah. is critical and if you don't know that and and you haven't ever experienced that we've all been in rooms that are over damped that that just drain the energy out of the music and 
If you calculate what our music costs with, with the price of amplifiers today, my gosh, amplifiers twenty, thirty, forty thousand dollars. I saw some past lab amps the other day, eighty five thousand dollars. I mean and speakers that are equal in price, what does that equate to per watt? Well, that's a lot of money. So you want to make sure you're hearing all of that because we have made great strides in amplifiers and speakers, but people don't understand the power of the room and, and room acoustics have kind of lagged behind. And we need uh, more education in that area. We need more uh, people experiencing yeah. diffusion. And uh, this whole week we're, we're going to... Uh, be uh, playing that. We're going to have some people come in on Thursday and Friday and uh, uh, bring some new amplifiers in and uh, we're going to try those. But we're, we're taking this week to uh, really address the room in its entirety and uh, work on the issues uh, that the room acoustics have. Yeah, and, and really begin to understand and hear what all of this means. You know, I, I can't put it into technological terms, but I can put it into what my ears hear. And I would love to hear what my LS358s and my Stereo 70 and my PAS3X and my Rega 1 turntable and my Sure Type 5 micro-rich cartridge would sound in the room. room. Yeah. I, I, seriously, Dennis, I, it sounded good then. Yeah. And, yeah. oh my goodness. So, I look forward to the the future. Yeah, it's going to be good. It's going to be a fun fun week for us. One of the things you have to realize with room acoustics, it's a s combination of a bunch of little things that produce big sound. Controlling the sidewall reflections so that the direct sound and the reflected sound arrive at the listening position in balance. You know, so so and that's going to be a little different for everybody because everybody's tastes are a little bit different, but. You've got a time frame to work with and you need to do it. And rate and level of absorption on the sidewall is critical. Diffusion, front and rear walls, very, very, very important in our hi-fi rooms. People just don't understand that, how important it is. We have six diffusers, six of our uh, QDA series in here and uh, we still need some more. And we're going to... Uh, talk about actually building Bruce a wall of diffusers for his front wall and then I want to build him a wall of diffusers for his rear wall but we're not going to be able to do it permanently so we're going to build individual units that he can move in uh, and move out uh, as uh, conditions dictate so um, this gives him a little bit of a flavor I only had six units in inventory right now to bring so but he's really uh, He's really had his ears open with diffusion. Yeah, yeah. Tell us a little bit about the sound of diffusion. What, what's different? <clears throat> Remember when we had him right up against the chair yeah, the other yeah. day and then I moved him back? T tell us a little bit about that. First of all, no matter where they are in the room, um, you adjust the chair and the distance with the diffusers behind you and in front of you to really accommodate a sound stage and whatever you're looking for. But all of a sudden, with these here, you know, it was a very simple uh, test, and I've done it before. Just put your hands behind your ears when you're listening to your music. Well, all of a sudden, everything becomes more articulate, but you can't listen to it because it's so bright, because you, it's your hands. Yeah. Well, simple as it sounds, that's exactly what the diffusers do, only the articulation is, and that's the only way I can say it, is something I've never experienced before. Um, I do think that a lot of the, the, the tonal color and the musicality and all this kind of stuff does come from your system. But there's no question in my mind that the diffusers bring all of that out. And, you know, it makes, it makes a ten, it makes a $5,000 system $20,000. And I, 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 it's it's really unbelievable. So, you know, the hard part was, you know, here's my room, and it was the worst room in America, as we all know. <laughs> and the, and the, the, actually, the, the person that I bought the speakers from, my old speakers, 
you know, everybody walked in here and said, what are you doing with this room? This has got to go. But nobody had the answer. They knew it was bad. But, okay, what do I need to do? And so this idiot came in and, anyway, so it's been a pleasure. Yeah, it's, it's, well, it's, a, it's been a great project because this is a big room. We got... Uh, 16? 16, 18 foot slanted ceilings, all kinds of alcoves and, and stuff. And uh, we're actually doing our uh, absorber blinds, which we're going to come out with uh, next year. Uh, Bruce is getting the first two uh, right out of our shop. And uh, those will be ready in about a week, oh, about a month. And then we'll, uh, we'll do a video on those for you. Those have our half inch foam on both sides of a vertical vein with fabric on both sides and uh, works just like a vertical and you cover your windows with it you get an inch of foam absorption so you get that bounce off the glass into the foam you get any uh, reflections from the room into the foam on the other side um, and then you can open them and then close them and Bruce has the standard uh, eight foot by seven foot uh, sliding glass Arcadia door that we all uh, have in, in our homes and the whole thing will cover the window, collapse to 15 inches. So it's going to be a great product for glass because glass is a, a pet peeve of mine. I firmly believe that uh, sound takes on the characteristics of the surface that it strikes. Don't ask me to prove that scientifically, but we all know what our sound in our cars sound like, and that's that's real good example of glass sound. It's like listening in a fishbowl no matter where they put the manufacturer puts the speakers in the car it the reflections off the glass are hideous and uh we it's brittle it's bright and and you always get that with glass so our absorber blinds are going to uh take care of that for us so uh well enough talk we're going to do some listening so thank you very much <laughs>